Paleo to Pioneer presents Small Batch Science, Episode 6. Two. Hi, I'm Andy, and today we're going to talk about Clovis biface and point technology. We're going to start for a moment, or a minute or two here, and talk about exactly what do I mean to intentionally exclude by saying that. First off, Folsom, a fluted technology, but clearly, obviously, after, after Clovis, so for the moment, out. The other things that I mean to intentionally exclude are particularly the Northeast Clovis, or I'm sorry, oh, that was terrible, the Northeast fluted material. The stuff that comes out of Lamb, Vale, Debert in Nova Scotia, Bullbrook in Massachusetts, uh, and Ganey as well, which all of them should end up being their own discussions and we can talk about them, but they're just not part of this for a number of reasons that I'll get into it another time. The Alaskan fluted and the Nana stuff, we're not going to talk about that either. Uh, any of the potential pre-Clovis things, such as the Miller Point in beer form from um, Meadowcroft in Pennsylvania. Uh, here in Florida, another potential pre-Clovis one we have, besides the Page Ladson stuff, um, are the Simpsons that we've now found stratified, we think, below Clovis at Wakulla Springs. Also in Florida we have presumably, though not dated yet, on after Clovis, all the Swanee stuff. Um, again, out of here. Within Clovis itself, the Clovis technology writ large, uh, don't want to get into the blade core or blade and blade tool technology today, nor anything about the bone and ivory and antler tools. I'm um, also going to avoid experimental things that have been done with darts and points and even tremendous early stage bifaces, a beautiful one that Woody Blackwell made, but uh, not today. On the Vero crew at Wakulla when we had big crews and where we um, where I've taught over the years, tried to you know use the Clovis technology book and, and really incorporate the things that Bruce Bradley and Mike Collins helped beat into my head and show using about a hundred, I think 101 different sites that manufacturing uh, data preserved in the material from 101 sites. I distilled it down into a sort of one-page cheat sheet that I need to revise and I'll put on the website in a post about all this stuff where I'll put up lots of pictures to make it easier for any, anyone who wants to to see it. But the, the little table there has 20 things that occur from beginning to end in a sort of idealized form and we'll get into the nuts and bolts of exactly what that means and why we would say it that way or in this case, I'm the one responsible, so don't hang this on Bruce and Mike, it's my fault. But I'll let you look at that for a second and so you can grab it if you want to view it, and we'll put it up online as well. All right, enough of what we're not going to talk about. What we are going to talk about is Clovis bifaces and points. And we got lots of examples to show everything I'm going to talk about. I, I, and um, multiple examples of, a, of, a many, of, no, of many of them, and I think it'll um, help make a lot of these things a lot clearer. I should probably hang about 55 caveats up at the front end of this and say, first off, uh, even with all this, sometimes you just flat out can't tell on a used or broken or, you know, resharpened point. You just scratch your heads and say, I don't know, maybe. And, and there's just, in point of fact, no way to get around that. But we'll walk around the continent here for a moment and talk about how to sort out the whole of the archaeological record and, and some things to keep in mind. Let's start with some of the big examples from up in Washington and a few from the Wenatchee cache. The site type is important, so caches with points and bifaces, fen, a number of things from there. Again, points, bifaces, and even early stage bifaces that are not necessarily preforms are well illustrated in the book. and. If you have it, flip through it while we're talking. It'll make a, make a lot of this make a lot more sense. Um, isolated things from, from smaller sites in Utah, uh, Idaho or Wyoming, uh, up in Oregon, or back in Illinois, and, and across the continent and, and beyond. Um, I'll use a number of casts to illustrate a number of things about Clovis technology and behavior from a bunch of the kill sites. Um, Oh, Dombo, Naco, Colby, Kimswick, Lang Ferguson, Blackwater Draw are all well represented here. We'll talk about a few other outlier things and why you might still scratch our heads about them. Lots of uh, nice Florida examples, both 
uh, casts from Sloth Hole and a few other places, a um, number of real artifacts from Sloth Hole and one from uh, west of Tallahassee that's an interesting little biface. But really going to try and focus on using examples of unfinished points and earlier stage preforms to talk about the process of reduction and the technology and, and the pattern behavior that goes into that. Um, and of course rely heavily on the material from Galt where mercifully and very kindly after I graduated in 2004 from Florida uh, Mike Collins took me on as a uh, uh, postdoc and worked with the, the, those guys for about five years and got to handle an awful lot of the 600,000 plus Clovis artifacts from the four discrete layers with everything else in the in central Texas above them and even a very complicated pre-Clovis story below it as well. Um, we'll kind of go through a bunch of the things that were in that one page sheet and just talk about the things that went into the Clovis technology book, um, the section about making these and what things we should expect to see on Clovis points. I'll, hang on, I should just start with the historical beginning of it just like you normally would. So these are a number of the points from Blackwater Draw, the original Clovis excavation in 1936 included these two along with two bone and another four or five stone Clovis points with the two mammoths that uh, John Cotter and um, E.B. Howard dug. And I love using this one because Clovis in a microcosm t can tell you the whole problem with the whole of the archaeological record of, of early paleo Indian Clovis material. Clovis sits in Portalis on a very lithic poor part of the North American landscape. That this stone, probably some Edwards Plateau stuff that came from in excess of about 200 miles to the east. So they're hanging on to it. This point has been heavily resharpened on both sides. You can see lots of little tiny pressure flakes up and down it. It doesn't really look like a very good Clovis. And, and that's in part because of the strategy employed at that time. I used to have a cast, but for obvious diminutive reasons, you can tell why, we lo why I lost it, is that little thing was found in the 60s in another mammoth. It, somebody actually put that on the end of a dart and went mammoth hunting successfully. And that's sort of a strange point we'll bring up with um, a lot of the kill sites, is that the points are really quite small. The largest point that's ever been found at any of the mammoth or mastodon kill sites is 125 millimeters. And I confess I don't have one that quite that size. But about, about like this. Everything else has been smaller, and some of them much smaller. And in fact, a lot of them are much smaller, and, there, and there's reasons for that. Not just simply where they are on the lithic landscape, but two other factors really need to go into consideration here. The constraints of, or lack of constraints, is really the more important thing at manufacturing, but the, the constraints of material quality and material package size are critical and when you sort of incorporate those by site type with where you are on the lithic landscape <laughs> now that's a mouthful right but when you think about things with shuffling the deck in that regard suddenly the totality of the archaeological record of clovis at at least site or assemblage level should start to make a whole lot better sense and we'll run through some of that stuff now so we still call it Clovis, A, because it's the first one, and we called it Clovis in the beginning in 1941 when after the uh, conference in Santa Fe, and everyone wanted to distinguish what these things were from the Folsom points. Uh, but finished, used, and abused points are the tail wagging the dog, and that unfortunately has been the main problem in this part of archaeology for 75, almost 100 years now. Good grief, it's closing in on 100 years now. So, we'll talk about manufacturing and the reason first, and the reason is, obviously that's where it starts, but also the manufacturing from raw nodule to big biface, recognizable preforms, later stage preforms approaching unfinished points, to pristine unused points are intentional patterned behavior where there's repetition of all of these things that can be shown in multiple examples from across the hemisphere. That'll be my big surprise at the end. The 
use life. When they enter their active use life and things start to happen, you get impact fractures, bases are blown out or flat out broken off. Points need to be resharpened, either thinned or made into nubs. It becomes incredibly idiosyncratic and even then it becomes very hard as well to you, you have to start worrying about skill and performance of the napper and the idiosyncratic whatever that happened to the point in the first place and made it no longer functioning and in need of repair and that the repair or rejuvenation is really specific to those points. So, patterned, repetitive, clear, intentional behavior versus ad hoc idiosyncratic, um, far more variable. And that, with, even with that caveat hanging on there, there's still pattern behavior in the resharpening and rejuvenation of these things, but you just can't count on it and, and necessarily recognize it in the same way that you can with the, with the um, preforms and bifaces and stuff, and unfinished points. So, um, I'm relying largely on the Clovis Technology book that Bruce Bradley, Mike Collins, and I and, and a couple others wrote in 2010, and that incorporates an awful lot of ideas that, that Mike, especially, and Bruce later, but Mike really took the brunt of re-educating me, because when I graduated, I had a lot of bad ideas, and hopefully this video is where, for other people who have similarly bad ideas that I had, uh, those ideas will die today. The Fen Cash book shows uh, really good images of all the points and bifaces and preforms and it is a really good um, example or a good place to see a lot of what I'm talking about and I may refer to it every now and then but when I write up, up a post to put on the blog or on the website about all this I'll make sure to illustrate everything I'm saying and, and if anyone has questions ask me and I'll try and come up with good examples to, to show you exactly what I'm talking about. So going from a raw piece of stone on a fairly regular basis and this is really coming from places specifically Galt, but other things like the Little River sites that Carl Yannick dug in Kentucky, um, all of, uh, uh, the other and the other large manufacturing sites where they're not constrained by package size or material quality. When they are unconstrained, they go large. And if you think of the 38 centimeter long and what 15, 20 centimeter um, biface out of the Anzig cache, there's a flake in Galt that came off of a complete overshot flake that came off of a biface that was bigger than that. It's something ridiculous, like 19 or 22 centimeters long from platform to, to termination. It's gigantic. It has nothing, the Clovis napping strategy had nothing or nearly nothing to do with conservation or efficiency. It is about performance. All of the technology, the bone, the blade, the ivory, the stone, stone points, is a, if you think about it in terms of maximizing performance of the tools, it'll help make sense of all of it as well. So, when unconstrained and you have big package material or big packages of material of really nice quality, you start seeing things like 20 centimeter bifaces or preforms. So, some of the things that happen early on, um, of course I don't have a cast of this, the ends end up concave or convex, both tip and base fairly early on. They start to regularize the edges with opposed alternating flakes, which is something that um, uh, Bruce Bradley described early on in the Agate Basin book back in the 80s and has elaborated in other articles and, and really is in full form in the Clovis Technology book. They also flute early and they flute often. And a lot of those things we threw out as not being Clovis, that I'm not really addressing. One of the things that really is a distinguishing characteristic is that Clovis sometimes fluted very late as a near last step to finishing a point, but it is the exception. It is not the rule, and normally, and this is where the Fen books got some great examples, um, early preforms and very, er very even earlier bifaces oftentimes have a flute that's coming in at about a 45 degree angle, maybe 30 to 45 degree angle, and what they're doing is intentionally not driving it down the center of the biface. That comes a little bit later, um, and the reason, and this is again in big packages, um, part of the reason for that is to avoid, you know, 
um, diving hinge fractures like on um, this little guy from that happened at Kim's Week. They do the same kind of strategy out on the tip. This one's a little early in the process for it, but this one from Kincaid Rock Shelter west of San Antonio, Texas has got, I think, a couple examples. No, it's not a great example of it, but um, they'll take what we've, we've dubbed chevron flakes off the tip. They'll take two here, three here, and do the same on the other side, and basically shape and form the tip without basically fluting the end, where they're trying to avoid driving a flake down and taking off too much, or of course diving and breaking the tip, which is you know the last thing they want at that point. So as we move through the bifaces, you get general outline is becoming pretty clear. Concave bases get replaced by beveled ends to work flutes down the center line. The, the piece has pretty regularized edges right on, very early on, even in the bifaces, certainly uh, very well developed by the time you get to this point in, in various preforms. The piece will be straight. The edge is almost centered, which is a really crazy thing. On lots of good Clovis points, you can feel it right down the middle that that, that biconvex cross section is perfect. Even, even on the Clovis type specimen, and this is a pretty good example of this, it's just a cast, but you can feel it. There, you can feel that there's almost a bubble right down the center line. And, and part of that is, I think, the strategy for you know maximizing the strength of that thing or, or maintaining the strength of it, even as they're narrowing it and not trying to lose any length on it. Uh, Overshot flaking is a very intentional thing that happens very early and often and goes all the way through to fairly late in the process. And it's not strictly that they're just doing overshot flakes. It's not a simple catch-all that explains everything any more than saying fluting is, is the last stage or, or whatever. It, 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 it doesn't help to think in, you know, yes or no sort of categories. This little guy from um, Kincaid is a pretty good example of a fairly late stage flute that was successful but probably had what we call a flute termination uh, divot that at the end of the flute it, it goes along and has a little blip at where the flute then hinges out instead of just a nice clean feather termination and so on this one somebody came back and hit a beyond midline or in this case probably just about overshot it looks like it went all the way across at least at the surface of it but it dove and this it broke the biface and you can see on this side pretty well where we glued the pieces. Um, so overshots are, are a normal regular patterned part of it but it's not the one and only true characteristic. All of these things go together and of course from early stage you know biface to early or middle preform to late and unfinished points no one piece can show all of these steps because some are obliterated. It brings an interesting point up that you can actually get to um, a point, no pun intended, where yes there is a, such a thing as unfluted Clovis. It probably was fluted, it probably, um, there's no reason to not consider a, a Clovis, you know, a, for whatever reason, a, un, uh, you should not consider it an unfluted technology. The problem is as things get resharpened and rejuvenated and kept alive, actually this one's probably the best example of it, because it's so heavily resharpened, the flute is greatly reduced. It's very heavily obliterated and it's obviously still fluted on both faces, but it's getting harder and harder to see it. And that is an important distinction that, that I need to make as well. That at big manufacturing sites, unconstrained by package quality or or size uh, they go huge go after tremendous things and some virtuoso performances creating gigantic things this is ridiculous what would you do with that poke your little sister it's not you're not it's not useful somebody's showing off they're still showing off oh here let me do diagonal ribbon flaking up one side and down the other Oh yeah, no, we, they gotta be like that or they'd never work. The ability of the, the master's level Clovis snappers is preposterous. The skill level is, is unbelievable and the performance preserved in stone is really something to behold.
So when you see these things and realize that, you know, I showed the biggest clovis point and one of only a couple or three uh, diagonal ribbon flaked points, they're uncommon, but they're showing exactly how good these folks were. So overshot flakes are not an accident. Beveling to isolate platforms to knock flutes off is the norm, but it's not exceptional. It's just how they did things. What's exceptional, and this is an example from Thunderbird in, in Virginia, they did on occasion isolate little nipple platforms and then remove a flute. And, and these, maybe they're doing them with um, some sort of uh, third party aid, but uh, the normal pattern is freehand percussion, just knock them off. Knock them off early and just boom. The distinction that I wanted to make that I hadn't really said about manufacturing versus um, say the kill sites or when things are being used and are out on the lithic, out in the world being used, is that um, not only is it idiosyncratic, but the, the behavioral um, strategy changes. It changes from, I, I don't have to be worried about wasting stone, I can make as big or as little or whatever or as many of a thing as I want, to uh, holy cow, we're 200 miles from there and uh, what, 70 kilometers from the nearest stone of, that's usable to them in any sense, we better make it last. Same thing you see with a lot of the other sites where, or, and I'm using kill site point examples in this case, um, because that's what they had and when they encountered Mammoth or Mastodon, that's what they used. And some were earlier in the process and, and heavily resharpened as well at Kimswick in Missouri. And some were just about used up and finally at, at that spot were used up. And so there's a real, a couple of real good examples of um, seeing Clovis people that haven't mapped onto the landscape yet. These are from Lang Ferguson in South Dakota. They were with the adult and juvenile mass mammoth that uh, Adrian Hannes and crew excavated years ago with all the bone tools and stuff. Work to a nub. Tiny little... Uh, you want to go after mastodons with that? Or mammoths? Probably not. But they did and successfully so. And the thing that's really interesting here is they appear to have not yet at that point found an unbelievable stone source about a kilometer away from the site. So I think it's white naviculite and they could have made anything they wanted but either they hadn't been there yet and obviously they were otherwise engaged doing something else with the mammoths but um, it um, is a pretty good indication of the change in behavior from I'm gonna make whatever I want to holy cow I gotta find a way to make that work but if you think again in terms of maximizing performance. When you're using stone from Gulp, you can make any big old thing you want. And when you've wandered into the middle of South Dakota and don't know the area yet, you better keep those little nubs alive. The first time I saw a picture of this, I think it was on the back of Tankersley's book, and there was no scale. And I had no idea how he got a picture of that point from Sloth Hole. And of course, if you do the fish trick, you know, are they the same size now? technologically, morphologically, very, very similar. I um, haven't really bogged down on morphometrics and morphology yet. I'm not a fan. These are not biological ent entities. They do not reproduce themselves, and they are subject to the limitations of performance, skill, material quality, package size, and any other number of things that just don't translate well into measuring length and width and ratios and stuff like that. That said, I'm all, I'm all for it, but it's not probably telling us what we think morphology and morphometrics are tell, is telling us. And that if you do that kind of work or analysis instead of the technology, you end up with articles where all the Eastern stuff, number of Clovis sites, uh, I think some stuff from Big Eddie in Missouri, and other, one of the last articles about Clovis morphometrics had four other kinds of points included because they didn't look at things technologically and sort things out either chronologically, geographically, or technologically. And that's really the one I'm harping on here, but the others will come up in the other videos when we, when we do talk about those things. So, trying to think here. 
with all the caveats and talking about the various size and stuff, um, there still are issues that become difficult to see and distinguish and, and make a positive comment on. This is one of the, the two little Clovis from, or I should say one of the two little fluted points from Shawnee Mini Sink in Pennsylvania. And technologically, I mean, it's tiny, but technologically, I don't have a problem. I think this is Clovis. I don't have a problem saying that. I could be wrong, and I'd like to see the real ones again and think about it a little more, but um, it, it seems consistent with what we've been talking about here and what we see at you know other sites and then other kinds of things. I'm wavering on the Sheridan Cave Point from Ohio. Very little tiny guy, heavily resharpened at the point, starts to look like that one a little bit more. Um, is the strange outline a function of simply the fact that it just got resharpened to a, a sharper point right at the end of its life cycle? Uh, maybe? I don't know. I, I intended to hold this up as an example of, um, I don't know, or I don't think it's Clovis, but the more I've looked at it, the more clovis -y I feel it is, but that's a highly unsatisfactory answer. I don't know, it's probably a reworked game or something, which we will talk about another time. Um, but I use those as an example of something that's really kind of important here, that, that I like to use as an example um, from some work that um, Tom Label and Steve Nash and I have done looking at the Minier site, which is from about 10 miles um, away from St. John's, Arizona, up, up, on the, um, up on the plateau. In the 60s, uh, uh, Graves and, and uh, William Longacre collected a bunch of material and tried some subsurface testing, but not, not a whole lot of luck, and found two very distinct, distinct clusters of stone, and one of them, it turns out, is absolutely screaming Clovis. The, um, Tom and Steve and I gave a paper at the SAAs a number of years ago um, where we talked about what we'd seen in the Field Museum and showed a lot of those things. And uh, very clearly, Clovis technology from start to finish, there's probably 50 or close to 50 preforms and point fragments in the assemblage. Um, and the beautiful thing we noticed was two blade core tablets, one of which was like knocking the top inch off of this thing to rejuvenate the, rejuvenate the flakes, or I mean the um, platform. So if you just bang, knocked it off, you have a hockey puck with a bunch of little short scars on the end. It's very clear there are two of them, not, not a problem. But the issue with the site there is that it's a, they had really good quality material. We identified 18 different kinds and there's probably a couple more petrified wood, obsidians, other uh, jasper, and a couple of other really interesting, beautiful materials. But 18 different kinds that are coming out of river-tested and beat-to-death potato-sized cobbles. they quite literally wonderful material in a package size that's just very hard and it is not going to allow for easy reduction. And the points start out about this big instead of being resharpened and worked down to this size, um, this is at the, the lowest end of them. And the best example we had was the complete uh, platform and flute dove and blew the base out. So the piece that's missing is this. But the shaped point with the flute still connected and the platform was 21 millimeters. That they intentionally, because that's what they had to work with, made a 21 millimeter Clovis at the beginning of its life cycle. The, the music stays the same, the, the lyrics change depending on where you are on the lithic landscape and what kind of a site you're at and what, you're, um, what, what kind of activities you're engaged in. What, what do you need your, your material to do? So morphology can be real fun and I get that. Here's three examples. One from Florida that I don't know where. Actually, I should use this side. It has almost the same flute, and you can see that it, if, it, if it had wanted to, it could have come out of this one that was found at Sloth Hole, which, same basic flute, same basic proportions, more or less, that is one of the larger ones that came from McFadden Beach in Texas. That the pattern of reduction really did stay pretty consistent, and obviously the manufacturing traits that are still preserved um, show a great deal of continuity in napping. And please, I'm only talking about the Clovis technology. I don't for a moment mean to say this is all one people, that they all spoke one language, that 
or, or ten languages. We have no idea. Are they all genetically related? Are they completely unrelated? Are there five groups? Are there 50 groups? We really don't know, and both, we just don't have enough Clovis dates that we feel are reliable, and we don't have enough information in a lot of those other categories. So, just trying to talk about this suite of reduction and, and cultural traits preserved in, in this aspect of the stone. So, a couple of pieces I'll end with. The overshot flakes regularly get used as uh, tools. This one's been retouched a little bit around the edges and has some um, uh, use wear. This, it's a cast from Sloth Hole. This is a real one from Sloth Hole. Complete flake that got retouched and used and abused all the way around. Um, have not been able to refit any of those on, on the Sloth Hole material, but again, that part of the, the toolkit and that part of the reduction and, and assemblage use is very consistent over a very, very large geographic area. That's probably where I should probably end this. I've talked about things from the state of Washington, maybe into Alaska there's Clovis, but I didn't think we'd all argue about that for a while. Um, a little bit down in California, in the Far Point Biface is probably one of the better examples from the coast there. Certainly into Mexico, over here to Florida, um, up into Pennsylvania, New York, how much into the Northeast becomes a more contentious issue as well. Um, but these three I really wanted to make as the end. Because these preforms, fluted on uh, both sides here, just uh, set up with a, a funky beveled nipple. Um, this one fluted from a bevel, and it's already had a nice removal over the old flake scar there from the, uh, nearly an over. Yeah, I, that was an overshot flake. Uh, these guys are from Venezuela. And I'd say that it's probably still pretty arguable that we don't really have a good geographic distribution, not really well mapped out, certainly into South America. I don't think we know where Clovis really ends going that way. And that that fairly narrow window of time, we now know lots of things that are probably contemporaneous and certainly flourish. There's a great fluorescence of many things immediately post-Clovis. But the pre-Clovis story is becoming more and more interesting. And in one of the other videos, I'll talk about what the Clovis record is telling us about how Clovis can't possibly be first. The simple fact that there's, what, 15, 20,000 of these things splashed across the hemisphere almost instantaneously in a geologic sense, and then they're gone, uh, they can't all be first. So something's wrong there, and we'll, we'll get into that another time. But, and I admit, it's a big high-end overview, and I'll try and go into lots of illustrations to make um, any of these sort of things um, easy to see on a post in a few days, but thanks for watching, and I gotta go pack. I have an expedition to do tomorrow. This should be a lot of fun. We'll talk about that as soon as I can. Thanks for watching, and please tune in to Small Batch Science on Paleo to Pioneer again.